This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. As Vladimir Putin continues his war on Ukraine, we learn about the country through the works of its authors and poets. For years, Ukraine fought to preserve its culture, its literary works and language from imperialism. Coming up, we talk about influential writers from Ukraine and how the history of its people shaped contemporary literature, too. And we learn why there's a new urgency translating Ukrainian writing into English. Do you have a favorite Ukrainian writer or poet to recommend? You can join us. You can share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. Joining us first is a writer, Askold Melnichuk, who's a professor at the University of Boston, Massachusetts in Boston. His latest work is a collection of stories called The Man Who Would Not Bow. He's also co-editor of From Three Worlds, an anthology of Ukrainian writers. Askold Melnichuk, welcome to our show. Morning, Lucy. Thank you so much for having me. I wanted to learn a little bit about your personal story, Oskold. And I understand your parents are Ukrainian refugees. So tell us about um, how they ended up in the United States. My mother's family is from Peremyshel, Poland. They're part of a Ukrainian community that lived there. Uh, my mother was going to university in Lviv when um, the Second World War broke out. Um, her mother fell ill. My mother returned from Lviv to Beremyshil to help take care of her. As the war progressed um, and the Germans moved in uh, and began to um, begin the Holocaust, a Jewish couple, uh, students of my grandfather's, wound up arriving on their doorstep one night and uh, they asked for shelter there. My grandfather took them in and they wound up uh, living there for the next nine months. Um, circumstances were uh, especially you know, tense and dramatic in part because they lived right across from the police station in the city. The, so the Soviet army arrived in 1944. My grandfather learned that he was on a hit list. He had already put his family at enough risk. And, uh, he decided that it was time to leave the city, something he desperately did not want to do. But leave they did. My grandfather and his children and my father, uh, who was from another part of the country and had been staying with my grandfather um, as he was falling in love with my mother, um, they wound up uh, in a displaced persons camp, as they called refugee camps in those days, in Berchtesgaden, Germany. And eventually they found someone to sponsor them here. And they finally arrived in the United States in 1950. My uh, father and mother had, uh, meanwhile, married while they were in the refugee camp. And uh, I was born four years after their arrival in New Jersey. They hadn't wanted to leave. Uh, they weren't immigrants. They were refugees. They were committed to trying to stay in their country to build it and help rebuild it. When I was driving into work today, I think uh, the number now are uh, 3 million people have fled Ukraine, refugees uh, like your uh, relatives once were. Uh, this must be a difficult time for you when you think about what's happening to Ukraine today. It's so utterly unexpected. The country had been uh, developing into <laughs> what we would call a normal country over the last 30 years, ever since it had achieved independence. Oh, we wanted to talk with you about uh, the role of literature in uh, Ukrainian identity and culture, its language. So while you were growing up, uh, what drew you to literature? Who do you remember learning about? My mother had wanted to be a poet, and uh, reading was uh, reading fine literature, reading poetry, reading novels was a kind of uh, given in our house. So my mother read to us as when we were little kids and encouraged us to memorize poems. Uh, memorizing poems was also a kind of commonplace practice in Ukrainian households. And that really is because of the singular figure in Ukrainian literature. Uh, I'm thinking of um, this fantastic figure of Taras Shevchenko, mm -hmm. who was a poet and a painter. He'd been born a serf, but his master, his owner, had recognized that he was a talented draftsman and so had sent him to uh, art school in St. Petersburg. And there, uh, a number of other uh, established artists and friends recognized his gift and bought his freedom 
by auctioning off a painting of the Tsar, as I recall. And uh, he went on to become the most important figure in Ukrainian literature and perhaps in Ukrainian statehood. I can't think of a comparable figure in any other world literature um, because Shevchenko was a kind of hybrid of Frederick Douglass, Walt Whitman, and Abraham Lincoln. His poems told the story of the suffering of the serfs, the, you know, who were essentially slaves, for the first time in the, written in the vernacular, written in the language that people spoke, not in the kind of formal and official language of empire, uh, which was Russian. Um, his words gave meaning and dignity to the people's suffering and articulated their longing for justice. People all over the country began to memorize those poems, and they have, that tradition of learning his and studying his poetry has been passed on across generations so that we celebrate his birthday and spent a good part of his life uh, in the Russian uh, gulags in, uh, as an exile and imprisoned for writing on behalf of the freedom of the people. And he died just as serfdom was being abolished in Ukraine. So he was sort of the foundation. And from him, uh, grew a number of other important poets. Literature has always been a way in which people had their lives witnessed and their experience reflected on. It has mattered and continued to matter. You know, there's more, uh, the, the whole sort of history of the evolution of the literature is tragic uh, in part because the efforts of the Russian Empire to restrict Ukrainian self awareness involved a censoring of work written in that language. This led to something called the um, aborted, what I call the aborted renaissance. Um, shortly after Ukrainian independence in 1919, which lasted only a few months, there was a kind of flowering of Ukrainian literature again. That flowering was cut short under Stalin's time. Just to give you one sort of um, fact there, in 1930, there were something like 260 writers active in the country's literary life. By 1938, only 36 of them remained on the scene. 220 Of the 224 that were missing, 17 had been shot, 8 had committed suicide, 175 had been arrested or interred, 16 disappeared without a trace, and only 7 died of natural causes. So that there's always been a concerted assault on the literature um, as part of an effort to erase national consciousness and self-awareness. You're hearing on Zoom with us Oskold Melnichuk, a professor at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. His latest work is a collection of stories called The Man Who Would Not Bow. He's co-editor of From Three Worlds, an anthology of Ukrainian writers. As we talk about the role of Ukrainian literature uh, today um, as the world watches, uh, as this country is continually being attacked by uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, when we talk about the history uh, that you uh, recited, um, the fact that uh, the, the legacy uh, of poets like Shevchenko, and when you think about your ancestry, how did that influence your writing, Askold? Well, it's a complicated story, in part because while, while when I was a child, I uh, read and dutifully memorized hundreds of lines of um, some of the poets whose work I've mentioned, um, and in fact, would recite them publicly at various venues uh, on special holidays, holidays and special occasions, a practice that uh, will be familiar to many of <clears throat> your Ukrainian listeners. Uh, I, as I grew older, you know, I began to recognize that the literature that I had been reading, um, as encouraged by my parents, uh, was reflecting a life in a world that did not uh, actually jibe with what I was seeing around me growing up in suburban New Jersey, 20 miles outside of New York City. And, and so, you know, I felt a tension between what um, I was kind of rehearsing publicly and formally and what I was experiencing. So that as I began to uh, write myself, I felt uh, divided about how to approach uh, what a writer's mission was, because the Ukrainian literature in which I had been weaned was so much in opposition to a very kind of particular world and set of circumstances, <clears throat> I did not feel that that was you know quite what I was encountering and writing about. As a result, sort of my actually my early stories were more influenced by. Um, writers whose uh, world was closer to Connecticut suburbs. I mean, writers like John O'Hara or John Cheever, 
and and uh, I was trying to avoid uh, the material that was my inheritance, which felt at the time like a burden I was not ready to tackle because the history was tangled. Uh, because at the time, Ukraine was a kind of terror incognita, you know, an unknown country, a country that um, people did not quite believe existed and did not want to credit as existing. And so um, for a long time, you know, I wrote stories in which my characters were nameless and the stories took place in uh, nondescript geographical settings without any history, or they took place among uh, uh, Wall Street brokers uh, who wound up rushing off to their homes in Connecticut, again, worlds about which I knew nothing. Eventually, I was able to break through that block and begin to try to address uh, the particular reality that was um, my own legacy. And at that point, I wrote my first novel, What is Told, in which I was able to uh, synthesize something of the history that I had heard about uh, and in a way let others know about it, um, even as it was met by a certain amount of resistance and skepticism. Mm. Coming up, we're going to hear Oskold read uh, from one of his latest works. Uh, but our listeners should know that you also work as a translator and an editor bringing Ukrainian literature to the English-speaking world. Uh, since the war broke out, there has been a push to get more Ukrainian to English translators. Uh, the New York Times reporting recently, it started with a request from the associate director at the Tompkins Agency for Ukrainian Literature and Translation, who wanted to highlight Ukraine's distinct literary and linguistic heritage. Can you talk about this request and, and how the literary world responded? Um, yes, gladly. Yes, so Jenya Tompkins' uh, important work as <clears throat> a kind of uh, clearinghouse for that brings together Ukrainian writers and translators is a kind of profound project, uh, incredibly timely, and she was really well positioned to help with this uh, uh, process of transition. You know, in part, again, Ukrainian literature has long been overshadowed by um, Russian literature and the sort of incomprehension of uh, our, an understandable incomprehension of readers and our audience in our Anglophone audience here uh, was a um, roadblock to getting word out about it. And the, this, the urgency of the moment has um, happily, uh, opened some of those doors. Uh, you know, I became involved in, with the kind of contemporary literary scene um, most directly in 1990 when I had received an invitation to come to KU uh, for a poetry conference. In 1990, the Soviet Union still stood and I had I had um, <laughs> second thoughts about going, but then of course I was decided to go and was um, the people I met in KU in 1990 became lifelong friends. I'll never forget sitting in an auditorium in that city, listening to a young writer by the name of Oksana Zabushko. Mm. She had just published her first book. Um, we, we had, there were like 25 or so of us from outside Ukraine who were either Ukrainian born writers of an older generation or like myself, uh, children of Ukrainian refugees uh, who were uh, already known as writers in this country who'd been invited to kind of meet their counterparts in Kyiv. And so anyway, so we, we were all asked to say a few words about why we were here and uh, what we were hoping to see. And meanwhile, the Ukrainian uh, writers uh, told us what they wanted to say to us. And uh, this young, uh, fiery young woman, um, 28 or 29 years old, uh, stood in front of the room and scolded us, uh, saying that if we thought we knew something about their experience, we should think twice, because we who were who either had left or were the children of those who had left had no idea of what they had experienced uh, over the last half century um, since my parents had gone um, in trying to establish their own sort of individual identity and claim to freedoms. Because after all, uh, writers remained repressed in Ukraine until uh, Gorbachev and Perestroika in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and uh, the last writer to die in a Soviet prison camp was a poet named Vasil Stus, who died in 19, 
85, at the age of 47, coincidentally the same age uh, that Taras Shevchenko was when he died. Anyway, Oksana just scolded us uh, and insisted that we open our eyes to their lives. Um, f- after that experience, I kind of came home um, deeply moved and committed to making sure that those unheard voices found an audience here. I was able, um, through literary uh, friends and connections in Boston, to uh, pull together uh, this anthology from Three Worlds that brought to American awareness uh, the really lively and uh, exuberant work of the latest generation of Ukrainian writers, most of whom have gone on to remain important figures in the culture today, particularly Oksana Zabushko. Mm. I'm glad you brought her up uh, because uh, when you talk about her being fiery, uh, the address that she gave b- the, before the uh, European uh, Union, the European Parliament, I believe on International Women's Day, uh, chastising the world uh, for ignoring uh, what has been happening in Ukraine since 2014 and the fact that uh, the spirit won't stop Putin's bombs. Uh, could you read uh, one of Oksana Zabushko's works for us? Absolutely, with pleasure. Um, This is a poem titled A Definition of Poetry. And the translation is um, by Michael Naidan and myself. A Definition of Poetry. I know I'll die a difficult death. Like anyone who loves the precise music of her own body. Who knows how to force it through the gaps in fear as through a needle's eye, who has danced a lifetime with the body. Every move of shoulders, back and thighs, shimmering with mystery like a Sanskrit word. Muscles playing under the skin like fish in a nocturnal pool. Thank you, Lord, for giving us bodies. When I die, tell the carpenters to take down the rafters and ceiling. They say my great-grandfather, a sorcerer, got out this way. When my body softens with moisture, the bloated soul, dark and bulging, will strain like a blue vein in a boiled egg white, and the body will ripple with spasms like the blanket a sick man wrestles off because it's hot, and the soul will rise to break through the press of flesh, curse of gravity, The cosmos above the black well of the room will suck on its galactic tube, heaven breaking in a blistering starfall, and draw the soul up, trembling like a sheet of paper. My young soul, the color of wet grass, to freedom. Then, stop, it screams, escaping on the borderline between two worlds. Stop, wait, my God, at last, look. Here's where poetry comes from. Fingers twitching for the ballpoint, growing cold, becoming not mine. You're hearing Oskold Melnichuk here on Where We Live as we talk about Ukrainian writers uh, today, uh, reading a poem uh, by uh, a very uh, famous uh, poet uh, in Ukraine, Oksana. Uh, Say her last name again for me. Zabushko. Zabushko. Uh, When I was thinking about what it must be like for uh, Ukrainian writers who are still in uh, Ukraine uh, today, uh, what are you hearing uh, from people within your circle? It's a, a, for me, a a very unnerving um, story. I'm in regular touch with a number of writers there, and uh, I'm working with a number of um, human rights groups in Uh, possibly looking for uh, places to um, house writers who are, who become refugees. However, what I'm hearing from all of them is that they are refusing to leave. And while a number of them have left KU and gone further West to places like cities like Lviv, um, they are still refusing to become part of the, refugee movement. Um, they are determined to stay and to fight. What's you know so shocking is hearing speaking to the uh, young 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 writers 
who I knew primarily as uh, poets writing about more traditional themes about love, about kind of growing up, about the struggles of daily life, they're suddenly becoming war poets. Um, they're becoming, their, their verse is becoming martial, angry, um, and all too similar to the work of their ancestors, the kind of work that um, I and they had hoped had the liter Ukrainian literature had been done with. For 30 years, it appeared that they had been done with uh, having to respond to extremes of violence and oppression and silencing and censorship. Um, and I think it's precisely, however, that it's precisely because um, they have sort of in their bones an awareness of what can happen should they surrender once more to uh, Russian domination, um, they would wind up living in an oppressive and authoritarian culture that would not allow them to speak freely. They have for 30 years been breathing freely, been able to speak their minds, been able to criticize their government as is possible in a democracy and impossible in an authoritarian, in a dictatorship such as the one that Putin has established in Russia. Um, and I think that they have decided that they would rather fight and die than have to live in that atmosphere again. Um, so what I'm hearing is that they're staying put and they, the, the um, men who are between the ages of 18 and 60 are either being armed or they are um, learning to working as first aid workers. We need to take a quick break. My guest again is Askold Melnichuk, uh, professor at University of Massachusetts, Boston, as we talk about Ukrainian literature today, about Ukrainian writers uh, around the globe, and those, as Askold mentioned, that are still in Ukraine. Pen America had an online conversation in early March and included writers in Ukraine. Uh, one writer and translator shared, the topic of our lives now is only war, Writing is on hold. I am only a man trying to survive, and I haven't any words to describe this experience, this Russian cruelty. More after a short break. You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. Today we're talking about Ukrainian literature with my guest, who is a writer himself, Oskold Melnichuk, professor at University of Massachusetts, Boston. His latest work is a collection of stories called The Man Who Would Not Bow. Uh, Oskold, when we think about um, after Ukraine gained its independence in 1991, how did literature change? Um, yeah, great question. Um, it was, again, a slow process of uh, one of their leading literary critics, uh, um, a, a brilliant young woman named Solomia Palichko, who became a friend and actually wound up um, spending some time teaching at Yale and at Harvard, uh, wrote the introduction to the uh, first sort of anthology of the literature written by uh, the writers who were in their 20s uh, when the country declared its independence. Um, they had to do a number of things. Uh, of, on the one hand, for the first time, uh, th it was possible for them to meet with writers from the West. And one of the things that writers from the West brought them was news of their own story, which was something of a shock to them, in part because the history of the previous 50 years had been censored it was not something found in any textbooks. You just mentioned the Holodomor, and the Holodomor was um, the artificial famine um, Stalin created in, the, in 1932, between 1932 and 1933, uh, in order to break the resistance of Ukrainian peasant farmers who were unwilling to be forced into communes. And as a result, um, Stalin uh, had the, all the sort of wheat and food that they had grown uh, taken from the villages, from the people, um, and sold abroad, uh, brought back to Russia. Um, meanwhile, 
the people who had grown the wheat, the people who had labor, worked on the farms themselves began to starve. Um, they starved by the millions. Many of the writers, younger writers, parents had experienced, and, and grandparents had experienced this famine, but had really been unable to talk about what they had seen. I mean, the things they had witnessed were beyond speaking. Um, they had witnessed cannibalism. Um, they had witnessed body parts sold in the marketplace. Um, in uh, their stories of um, certain families drawing straws to decide which member of the family was weak enough to become um, the victim who would sustain the, you know, the, the rest of the family. Th these kinds of stories obviously uh, were suppressed by um, the people who had somehow managed to survive it and were the stories that were only beginning to be unearthed um, after Ukraine gained its independence. Any kind of suppressed history eventually rises up. That was the first thing the writers needed to deal with. Uh, at the same time, in part because they were free for the first time to encounter uh, living writers from the West, they began to discover new ways of telling. They began to discover modernism and then postmodernism. So all kinds of formal experiments were being conducted in literature instead of having to write uh, stories that were sort of prescribed by the government, um, they were free to tell the stories, personal stories of about their own lives. So as they got over that, um, they began to respond to other parts of uh, the world beyond their borders that was suddenly kind of roaring into their experience in their lives. And that radical shift in uh, individual freedom and behavior was uh, reflected in the literature. Um, there was another element too, because at the same time, um, there, the, the Soviet sort of invasion of Afghanistan was, had just wound down and a number of the writers had served in the military and were um, returning with their own kind of war stories to tell uh, all too familiar to us here. I mentioned that you're a writer and your latest work. Uh, I wanted you to maybe read an excerpt for us, Oskold. Um, certainly. Um, so this is from the title story, The Man Who Would Not Bow. Um, the, the Man Who Would Not Bow is about a Ukrainian revolutionary uh, who begins as a supporter of the Russian Revolution, um, whose, uh, whose own family had been coal miners in the eastern part of the country. And this um, person had seen his own father and mother um, die early deaths uh, because of the kind of hard labor they had done in, uh, in the coal mines. And as a result, he had joined revolutionary forces, uh, believing in the ideals of a true people's republic. Um, he gradually grew disillusioned with those ideals as he discovered that uh, those who had assumed power were even more ruthless than those that they had deposed. And he is the man who would not bow. Instead of bowing to the forces that uh, had risen up around him, um, he decided to resist and spend his life in resistance. He eventually becomes a refugee. But this um, is the, what I'm going to read you is a paragraph from um, that period when he suddenly discovers that what he had fought for as a young revolutionary was not uh, what had come to pass. So this is um, from the man who would not bow. The amount of blood spilled in the intervening decades astonished everyone. One of Mikola's brothers disappeared in the Siberian Gulag. Another was responsible for stripping farmers in the eastern region around Kirovograd of their wheat, abetting a famine which led to millions of deaths. In some villages, cannibalism became common. The bodies of the lately dead were sliced up and placed on outdoor tables for sale like cuts of beef at a charcuterie. Mikola registered the losses in scars across his wrists marking two suicide attempts. Both times he himself changed his mind. He wasn't ready to give up. Then in the spasm of a paragraph, he fell in love. Mm. I wanted to hear more about uh, what you're writing 
uh, as you're watching uh, what's going on in Ukraine, as well as what you're hearing and seeing, Oskold Melnichuk, my guest, professor at University of Massachusetts, Boston, reading from his latest work, The Man Who Would Not Bow. We'll continue talking with Oskold after the break. You can join us, too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're focused on Ukrainian writers today and what we can learn about Ukrainian culture and identity through them. My guest on Zoom, Oskold Melnichuk, a writer and professor at University of Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, Earlier, you read a poem from Oksana Zabushko, and I wanted you to maybe tell our listeners about another poet, uh, Zerhe Jadon. Zerhe Jadon is a, a remarkable character. Um, I remember going to a reading at Harvard uh, a couple of years ago uh, when he was coming through town. And, uh, you know, usually poetry readings uh, will uh, bring in, you know, a small number of people, 20, 30, 40, 50, uh, here in Boston, outside his country. Um, somehow, um, Jadan's sort of reputation preceded him, and there were several hundred people packing um, the auditorium. Um, he's a uh, Again, uh, by 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 force of circumstance, um, certainly not something that had been his intention when he began, has become a powerful uh, war poet. He is from um, the uh, Donetsk, from uh, the most besieged of the regions. In fact, he's from the part of the country where this war began in uh, 2014. Uh, from he's from the city of Kharkiv, uh, which is now enduring perhaps the most sort of uh, savage assault uh, from Russian forces that in Mariupol on the port in, uh, on the Black Sea are, are the most kind of um, assaulted cities at the moment. Um, Jadan is one of those poets who has refused to leave his home city. Um, he's uh, determined to not only remain there as a kind of inspiration for others, but to do practical things. By all accounts, he's still out on the streets helping to uh, bring people to um, bomb shelters and uh, trying to rally their spirits, because that's part of what po- what poetry does, after all, is inspirit us. Um, the kind of courage of the poet is really kind of tapping into the sort of deeper subterranean sources of the courage of people in general and of their um, bottomless desire to be free uh, and to stand up to power, to speak truth to it. Um, So Jadan is is also hugely prolific. He's a novelist. Um, A a new novel of his has just been published by Yale University Press called the novelist called The Orphanage. Um, He published a a poem, a, a book of poetry, called The New Orthography, translated by John Hennessy and Astop Keen. And uh, last year, uh, the American poet Major Jackson chose Jadan as a co-recipient, along with uh, St. Lucian poet Canicia Lubrin, of the Derek Walcott Prize, uh, which um, is sponsored by Aerosmith Press and the Boston Playwrights Theater. And for those of your listeners who are not familiar with the work of Derek Walcott, Derek Walcott was um, really kind of one of the great English language poets of the 20th century. He was from St. Lucia and he taught for many years at Boston University. Um, Anyway, so uh, Jadan was scheduled to come to Boston uh, to read uh, at uh, on May 15th, I fear that's not going to be likely now. And my hopes and prayers are with him as he uh, remains in the city of Kharkiv. I've also heard that he's recently been nominated for the Nobel Prize, and um, may they be attending his work. I mean, he, his work speaks for itself. Mm. 
I know you've provided us with a list to share with our listeners of, of book recommendations of Ukrainian writers and others. We're going to be sure to either tweet that out or put it up on our website, ctpublic.org slash where we live. Uh, we know that writing can also be cathartic. And I had asked or uh, mentioned that I wanted to hear more about, you know, what you're writing uh, today. Uh, have you gone back to poetry or, you know, what's going through your mind, Oscar? <laughs> yeah, well, I, mean, I, I just finished a, a, a novel that had been about an American whistleblower who blows the whistle on a murder and winds up himself being imprisoned instead of um, the having the, kill, the killers imprisoned. And uh, I, I was just beginning a new book when all this began. Right now, um, I'm only writing sort of short dispatches and responses to the war in Ukraine and uh, beginning to concentrate on uh, translating work that is uh, coming out from the country right now and trying to find places for it. Because what's um, so very important uh, for the people there is that they feel seen. Um, the sort of the tragedy of the country, uh, of its people, was that for much of the last century, they were invisible to the world. The um, you know the whole the whole demor the famine uh, in the 1930s happened while the New York Times uh, correspondent Walter Duranty was based in Moscow, denying that anything was happening in Ukraine. Uh, there had been a, a journalist from uh, the UK, Gareth Jones, who was on the other hand traveling through the country and reporting the famine and stories about it were being published in England, but not in the US. Um, so for writers, yes, um, the, the act of writing is itself cathartic, but it's the, the importance of it is the communication. Um, it is the word getting out to others and others attending to it that is so, so central. There's another um, sort of superb poet that I want to mention, um, Lyuba Yakimchuk, whose book Apricots of Donbass uh, was published this year by Lost Horse Press. And its translators are Oksana Maximchuk and Max Rosochinsky, along with Svetlana Lavochkina. Um, these are poems by another young poet who uh, was displaced from of the Donbass by a war that began in 2014 uh, and was forced to move to Kyiv then. She has since then been doubly displaced and is now in view, though I recently heard that she is um, planning to make a trip back to her, her native city, even under these most extreme and dangerous of circumstances. And again, Godspeed to her. Um, so, my work right now is uh, focused uh, for the foreseeable future on making sure that word about these writers gets out, um, that they are heard. Uh, we are hoping to have another um, hybrid event here in Boston on May 24th, sponsored by the Goethe Institute and the Brookline Booksmith, a superb bookstore in Brookline, uh, Massachusetts, in which we will have um, a, a number of American uh, writers, including uh, Robert Pinsky, um, reading with uh, Ukrainian writers zooming in live from uh, wherever they happen to be. Um, it'll be midnight for them, but they'll all be staying up to in order to connect so that we here can look into their eyes and let them know that we have seen them Having seen them, how can we turn our backs on them? How can we allow this slow motion slaughter to continue to take place? When you mentioned Jadon earlier being a war poet and the type of writing and literature we will see coming out of this this crisis, uh, Oskold, uh, I think you've said, you know, when we think about war, it's not over for a couple of generations and the, the ripple effects of that on uh, families. Uh, absolutely. And that's, again, the kind of horror and the of it all, that a war is not over when a peace treaty is signed. That's only the beginning of a healing process. Um, we in this country know this all too well. Um, it's certainly possible, it, it's arguable to say that the civil war in this country is not yet over, that all of its lessons have not been absorbed. 
um, and that the trauma of that war is passed on from generation to generation as people try to come to terms with both their kind of personal family histories and the complexity of perhaps having to recognize that what your own family had uh, and a position it had taken it had been wrong, um, uh, coming to terms with uh, uh, the anger that comes from having been victimized for so long, uh, so deliberately, with so much of the world witnessing this and not doing anything to stop it. Um, so yeah, this is again the the thing that you that I, we most want to shed that sense of frustration, anger, and horror that we might inherit from people who, for whom it is understandable because they had experienced it firsthand on their own bodies. But what they experienced it firsthand themselves, they unfortunately do pass on. And we'll have to leave it there. Oskold Melnichuk, a writer and professor at University of Massachusetts, Boston. What a pleasure to hear from you for the hour. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so very much, Lucy, for creating this opportunity. I'm deeply grateful to you and your listeners. Today's show produced by Tess Terrible. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We'll be back tomorrow.